All right, welcome everyone to the final session of the NAG Region Seat at the Table program. Today's topic is how to champion women leaders. We're excited that you're all able to join us tonight. My name is Cassie Ogani, and I'm the Manager of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Indigenous Relations at Niagara Region. To start, we are recording tonight's session, so those that are not able to make it can still hear from our great lineup of speakers. With the webinar set up, you're not able to turn on your videos or adjust your microphone. If there is a question you would like to ask during the question periods, we can uh, potentially give you permission. I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. As we take a moment today to reflect on the importance of the land on which we gather, our provider and sustainer, we look to understand the history of the land. Niagara Region is situated on treaty land. These lands are steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Hadawandaronk, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The Regional Municipality of Niagara stands with all Indigenous peoples, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. I encourage you all to do more to learn about the history and current situation of Indigenous peoples. This will help us better understand our roles and take responsibility towards reconciliation as treaty people, residents, and caretakers. I'm going to launch a poll to start the evening. The poll will help us to understand a bit about who we have around the table tonight. It's a set of seven demographic questions. For each of them, you can choose, I prefer not to answer. Uh, I will note that due to Zoom capabilities for the prefer to self-describe option, you can't actually self-describe. Uh, also, there were limited options allowed. So for looking at the municipalities that you're coming from, uh, there wasn't enough options for all of our municipalities. And so it's in two questions. I'll, as you complete that poll, I'll provide some background information on this project. The session is part of a project called Canadian Women in Local Leadership. It's funded through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, the Women and Gender Equality. We have partnered with Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce, Women in Niagara, City of St. Catharines, YWCA, Future Black Female, Services for Humanity, Muslim Senior Circle, and Niagara Region's Women's Advisory Committee to organize this session. The Seat at the Table's program goal was to increase the number of women, particularly underrepresented women, elected for municipal government in Niagara by promoting understanding, awareness, and confidence through provision of education and support to those interested in running for election. In 2022, we held four sessions to support underrepresented community members considering running for municipal government. Over 130 people attended at least one session. In the 2022 municipal elections, there were 82 women candidates, 17 of whom had participated in at least one seat at the table session. Of those 17, eight were successful. Two racialized women were elected, one in Welland and one in Niagara Falls, both of whom participated in our sessions, one of whom is participating as a panelist tonight. This is our fourth session in 2023, aiming to gather feedback and provide support to women who were successively elected to municipal government. Tonight, I'm joined by Barb Butters, recently retired after serving in the community of Port Coburn as a city councillor for 20 years and as a regional councillor for four years. She's married to a retired paramedic and has two adult children, two granddaughters, and one great-granddaughter. Barb will be introducing the panelists and keynote speaker and moderating the panel discussion. At the end of the panel discussion, there will be time for questions from you to our presenters. Feel free to post any questions or comments through the Q&A option or the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. You may have to toggle between the chat and live transcription features if you're using that. After the panel, Barb will introduce the keynote speaker, Walter Sensek, after which there will be again a time for questions. I will close the evening with some final comments. With no further ado, I will turn it over to Barb to introduce the panel. Thank you, Cassie. Uh, thanks also to our funders and to our partners for for uh, their participation, their help in doing all of this. So tonight we have three panelists joining us for a discussion. Uh, uh, I'd like to introduce Carrie Porter. Uh, she's the manager of homelessness prevention programs at the um, Housing Help Center of Community Care. She grew up in Cape Breton, but lived in St. Catharines full-time since 1998. Outside of the um, four years she spent as a city councillor representing the downtown ward in St. Catharines, 
She's been a political activist for several decades and has extensive experience in campaigns and politics. Carrie worked for an MP and an MPP and before this worked in the private sector in finance and the agricultural industry, um, as well as in construction. Uh, welcome, Carrie. It's good to see you. Uh, Kevin Gibson served as Wayne Fleet's mayor for the 2018 to 2022 term, which he began on a platform of investing in important infrastructure and getting the municipality headed in the right direction. In office, Mayor Gibson was able to work with council to tackle major challenges over the course of his term. Kevin Gibson was appointed to the Ontario Association of Police Services Boards on the Board of Directors in May 2022. Currently, he's an auctioneer who specializes in benefit auctions. Good to see you, Kevin. Welcome. Mona Patel has been living in Niagara Falls for 24 years after emigrating from India in 1999. She's happily married with two daughters, 20 and 16. She has a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a business background as she is a small, is a small business owner with her family. Mona has been volunteering for years and continues to do so with her current uh, city councilor duties. She's a, she is community oriented and strives to help the local charities and small businesses in Niagara. Mona is the first non-Canadian born South Asian woman to be elected in Niagara Falls. And we haven't met Mona, but it's nice to meet you tonight. Welcome. So panelists, we look forward to hearing from you this evening. So if we can get going right to the questions, um, this first one is for all three of you. And um, the question is, how can you become aware of your personal biases? What techniques or processes have you used to address your biases? And if Mona wants to start us off, that would be great. Hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank other, all the organizers for creating this event. I actually participated in Seat at the Table in the last project. And I want to thank everyone for having me. And it is honored to sit on this panel with Carrie Porter, Kevin Gibson, and Barbara. You were the panelists last time in the very first session we had. I remember that. And thank you, Cassie, for organizing all this. I just want to thank everyone first. And let's get to the question. Uh, when you read a topic and you have answer in your mind, that's a bias. Uh, it goes for people, work, food, and everything that's related in our life. It's natural to have bias. And uh, it is very much based on how you are raised and how you live your life. Well, nobody should be punished to have a bias, but first step is to acknowledge that you have bias and then educate yourself to do better. The key is slow down and investigate your beliefs and assumption. I encourage you to take a look at your network and see if you need to expand your network. Things that help me to diversify my thinking is uh, the media I consume, the podcasts I listen to, and the people I follow on social media. Because in my current role as a city councilor, I think as an elected official, you have to have diverse perspective. Uh, how I work on my bias as a city councilor is when we have agenda for a meeting, first thing I do is I read the agenda. And of course, I have opinion in my mind. But what I do is I do research online. There are lots of uh, topics online that you can read previous matters, and you can't believe everything you see online, but you have to come up with your own conclusion. And I usually make pros and cons list. Like if I, if it goes this way, what are the pros and cons? If it goes this way, what are the pros and cons? Then I discuss with my colleagues and staff, and they are actually very helpful. And I'm so lucky to have a great colleagues and staff who are always there to help. And then I sleep on it and I go to the council chamber without making, making a decision. I do have opinion in my mind, but I go with open mind because what happens in council chambers is when we discuss a topic, some <gasps> counselors ask questions that I have never thought of it. So that's a perspective I didn't think of it. So sometimes it changes my mind completely. 
So I go into council chambers without making my mind. And when it's time to vote, that's when I make my final decision. So this is how I work on my biases. Thank you, Mona, appreciate that. So um, Carrie, would you like to take a crack at this? Sure, uh, I initially struggled with this question because bias is a, really a blind spot and nobody wants to believe that they have biases. It's, it's a difficult thing to confront in yourself. Nobody really wants to be told that they also might carry a bias. So it's, it's a hard thing to talk about. People tend to get defensive, but I like what Mona was talking about when she was talking about being in council and having an open mind. I had some really great experiences uh, around the council table when we had some really difficult decisions to make. And my favorite meetings were often sometimes contentious decisions where we all brought our own uh, perspectives and strong opinions at the table. Um, and we might not have all gotten what we wanted out of the decision, but when we spent the time listening and considering, um, we made a really good decision at the end. So I think for uh, decision makers and people on boards and councils, uh, it's, it's an important thing to talk about. The way that I try to think about biases is, um, I, I data and metrics are important to me. So. I'll give you an example. I can, you know, I would, I could go to the doctor and uh, I have a good doctor, but so not this doctor, but other doctors I've had in the past where I felt like they weren't treating my pain seriously. And, you know, I could say this doctor has a bias against me or against women. Um, that's a difficult thing to prove um, in a moment um, to help people understand how bias might work kind of on an institutional level or how it can affect um, people as a whole is to start looking at studies and literature, literature reviews um, that have been peer reviewed and cited. And one of the examples, there's a study that came out in 2001 called The Girl Who Cried Pain, and it was bias in um, decision making by uh, doctors in giving out pain medication. Um, and there was a massive study done and it, it, they discovered that women were um, less likely to receive pain medication for um, the, the same types of treatment and operations um, than men. And this, since then, there's been many studies done on this. Um, so if we're wondering how bias works, um, it's good to look at literature, literature reviews like this to see how it can work kind of on an institutional level um, to understand how it might happen. I don't think individually all of those doctors meant to um, not prescribe pain medication. And I don't, I think they, they, they did their best or what they thought was best. Um, but these are ways we can check ourselves. Sometimes we, we don't see the bias in ourselves, and it's always a good idea to have an open mind, um, look at literature, literature reviews like, like this and try to understand how bias can work and it can affect people and can affect uh, women, people of color, um, because these are ultimately the people we represent as counselors as well. So it's important to just gain an understanding and uh, it's a good way to check. Thank you, Carrie. So Kevin, you're next. I was just saying uh, thank you everybody for inviting me to this. Uh, it's a very interesting topic and uh, I've been looking forward to it. So um, bias is an interesting thing to me. I, I think human beings, bias uh, slash judgment, I think human beings are born with that and it's an absolute um, core part of our, our bodies and our brain. If you go through your day, you look at things constantly and categorize them or pass judgment on them, uh, be it um, an automobile, be it clothing, be it anything at all. And so I think that we just do that. I think that's just how we're made. The important thing is to get a handle on that judgment and bias when it can be causing pain or, or disruption to other people. Um, and uh, both Mona and uh, Carrie said it well in saying that uh, being aware of your potential biases and getting a, a handle on them is one of the most important things that you can do because I think we all have them automatically. 
in many areas. Um, so for me, what I always do is try to keep that open mind. Uh, it's very important. I don't know how many times in my life I've looked at something, and, oh yeah, it's this, definitely this. And then the next thing you know, you turn around and uh, it's not that at all. And you realize that your, your bias or your judgment on that uh, issue was wrong and that it was based on just the way you, you think things should be in that sense. So um, being aware of it is the most important thing and being aware of how it impacts other people. Uh, if it's just within yourself, if you're looking at something and you're, you're passing judgment on it within yourself, I don't, I don't really care for those kind of clothes or those, I don't care for this or that. That doesn't do any harm because it's within yourself. But it's when you start to voice that and you start to put it out there and, and be it people or other items. Uh, that it starts to ca cause harm. That is where it's so vital to be self-aware and uh, to catch yourself before you you start putting it out there um, by voice. So, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, but I think we all live with it every day. And even those of us who are are well aware of it um, still have that happen to us uh, during an average day. So, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. So we're going to move on to our second question. This one is for um, Carrie and Mona. And Carrie, you will be going first. So the second question is, what are some of the challenges, including systemic or structural barriers, that women in government leadership face, and how can they be addressed? And Carrie, would you start us off, please? Uh, sure. There's been lots of studies on this. Uh, I have to start with the systemic issues. So women haven't really achieved uh, parity in the workforce yet. Um, so we are more likely to have low paying jobs. Um, we still have more domestic responsibilities at home. So there's a the division of labor in the household um, presents challenges to get involved in public life. Um, it's where we make still about 72% of what male counterparts do. So accesses to resources, um, political capital, being in um, spaces where you get some, uh, get to be known, get to have political capital. And some of these spaces are still, um, you know, with the golf club and the country club. So it, it can be very difficult um, for a woman to feel like she has it in her to um, run for council or for something. I didn't think I would ever sit at a council table. I still, even on the night of the election, didn't feel it was my place to sit at that table. I didn't know what I was doing there. I'd never um, imagined it. Um, and honestly, it was meeting you, Barb, and Angie Demeray and some female councillors uh, doing some great work in local communities where I, I really felt there was uh, a role. So I think um, women talking to other women about it, um, creating more opportunities, like taking advantage of the seat of the table funding. I think that obviously demonstrated that it was successful and had, had an impact. So it's, um, civic organizations, um, organizing round tables, all those make um, a huge difference. Uh, for me, some of the challenges included, and it's funny because I went into council uh, into this role thinking that a part-time council position in St. Catharines was good and, and it would be accessible for people. Um, but after doing the job, I've completely changed my mind and I, I don't think it's accessible. I, I found that it was challenging to try and juggle my full-time job, um, my uh, the needs of my family, my children at home, and um, doing this uh, other job. So that was a huge uh, challenge for me. And I really feel like maybe the structure of the council role needs to change. I think the pay might need to change. And, um, you know, the older councillors um, who've been on council in St. Catharines for a long time, um, they don't have the same experience that I do because their, their partners or their wives uh, didn't work or they worked part-time so they were able to hold a full-time job and do this job at this on the side so they don't they kind of didn't understand where we were coming from sometimes so those are some of the issues that we could um, start thinking about in Niagara and 
I, I think we need to look at the, the council structure, the job itself, and how um, councillors are supported. It's not just about us. If you make things better for women, you make things better for all councillors. You make things better for, say, a single father who might decide to run uh, or people with disabilities. So it's not just about improving uh, women's participation at the table. I think it just would make um, the council life better for everybody. Thanks, Carrie. You make some really good points, and I appreciate your kind words as well. Um, it, none of it's easy. None of it's easy. Mona, would you like to answer this question, please? Uh, yes, I would. I actually agree with most of the things Carrie said, and I'm not going to repeat what she said because I'm just going to add something to what she said. Uh, as a woman, what I see is women are held at higher standards than men. You know, there's a quote by Hillary Clinton that explains this perfectly. It's like, it's hard to be a woman. You must think like a man, act like a lady, look like a young girl, and work like a horse. And that is what expected from a woman, like even if it's a political career or even a social aspect. You know, I think all the women understand what I'm saying. And another thing, and the second one is gender bias and stereotyping. When a man has assertive behavior, and it's, seen, it's seen as strong, commanding, and direct. But when women display the same behavior, they see her as aggressive, pushy, and shrill. And if woman be, woman's behavior is, is it uh, aligns with a traditional gender role, such as you know accommodating at the workplace, caring about other people's feeling, and she will always worry about the decisions she makes because as a woman, we are always uh, we are used to of making everybody around us happy. So with our decisions, we don't think about ourselves, but we always think about people around us. And if she focuses on that role, then they see her as a weak. So in a work in political uh, career, it's hard for women to win because you know if you're very strong, then they see you as a pushing. If you're very soft, then you know you're less competitive. And uh, in most of the cases for work and uh, life, life and work balance. If a woman is a primary breadwinner in the house, they are usually primary caregiver, but that's not the case for men. If men are a primary breadwinner, they're rarely primary caregiver. So this is the balance we need to bring in a work, a work and political life. Because most of the time women want to go into politics, but just because uh, the work and life balance that holds them back. And lots of research show that uh, bias, the primary that caused the barriers for women, they are the unconscious uh, biases that people are not aware of. It's like we, are, we have grown up seeing those biases. Is women growing up, we were always compared to models. We are supposed to look like a model. See, one of mom used to say, look at her, how pretty she looks. We were always held to certain standards. Because I remember when I was campaigning, I would be walking four or five hours in the sun. And when I knock on the door and when I hand them a brochure, people look at my picture and it's like, is that really you? And I'll be like, give me a break. I walked in the sun for five hours and that's a professionally done picture. Like I don't have no makeup on, I have my sweatshirt on. Like how could you compare that picture? But well, those are the biases we are, grow we are raised with. And those biases are always affecting women more than men. And how do we, uh, uh, get over these biases, I would say learning and development. You know, both men and women have to be aware of these barriers and biases and they both have to work together to minimize this. And overcome structure barrier with mentors and sponsors. Mentor is a person who guides and advises, but sponsor is someone who advocates for her to help her move forward. And uh, the way I see it, and I have seen that in a real life, if the man is um, sponsored to a female ally, a female, that helps her a lot more than female sponsoring a female because the, they both learn from each other. So that's, uh, that's the, my understanding of coming over this barrier. Thanks, Mona. I appreciate your uh, comments. Very interesting and very candid. Thank you. Thank you. So our next question is for all three of you, and I'll give you, a, Kevin, you're going to be on deck first, so I'll give you a heads up. 
third question is, how can you be a good ally for women counselors in Niagara? Thank you, Barb. Um, interesting, uh, important question, very important. Here's a, an interesting thing. When I first went on the police board in 2018, um, sitting there at headquarters, I look around, there's one woman and six older white males. And I was kind of shocked by that, actually. I thought, well, where's the diversity here? Where's you know, the, the people from different cultures and where, why are there not more women? That has changed, thankfully. Now there's no more women on the police board than, uh, than uh, men, which is a fantastic thing. Um, how can we be a good ally for women? I personally, you know, you got to get out there and you got to tell people. I run into uh, women who I believe would be excellent on council. And I said to them, I said, look, why don't you uh, start attending council meetings? Uh, oh, I don't know if it's for me. You know, it's it can be rough. Oh, yeah, it can be rough. And, and the, the public can dish on you pretty hard. But, you know, um, we need diversity. We need we need equal women. We need color. We need everything that um, that's an important, important component of success. One of the um, workshops I was at on the police board, uh, there was a very uh, a doctor speaking on diversity, and uh, he said the more diverse your group is, the better the answers are. Um, they've done studies and have found that the homogenous group of people are given a problem, and most of the time they're wrong, where the group of people that is diverse and, and debate and argue were right far more higher percent than those than the homogenous group so it is really really vital to coming up to with good decisions good processes to have a diverse group so i believe that to my core um i've lived with strong women i've worked with strong women my whole life to me a lot of it is i understand it but at the same time i still scratch my head um you know, how can women be paid less for the same job? That, I still don't understand that. I, I know it happens, but I, I don't understand how that can be. Completely wrong. Um, there's lots of things like that that I look at and I just go, you know, how's that possible? Um, like I say, I've, I've spent my life working with very strong women. I didn't find them any more pushy than men. In fact, uh, a lot more polished in many respects on, on getting what they wanted. Uh, but it's firm and aggressive. So, you know, I, I go out there, I, I see people who I think would be a good candidate. And I've done this even since uh, the last election. Uh, I've, I've spoken with some women and said, you know, you should consider running for council, be a local or, or, you know, of course, here in Wainfleet, if you get in as the mayor, you're on council at the region. But um, it's just an important thing. And I, I just wholeheartedly support it. And I think that we should be you know, all of us uh, promoting that um, in every aspect of our daily lives. So it's really important. Thanks, Kevin. I really appreciate your words. And I can say from experience working with you, your actions are, are um, follow those words to a T. Thank, uh, thank you. you. So uh, Mona, would you like to answer the question next? How can you be a good ally for women counselors in Niagara? Uh, Actually, as being a newly elected counselor, I never thought I would have a close and good relationship with my fellow women counselor and the staff. Uh, last week, I just made a connection with a newly elected woman counselor from another city. It was a pleasure to speak to her. We share struggles. We share about our struggles during the election, even as a new counselors. And only met her once, and we spoke for like almost an hour, and it felt like I knew her for a long time. And only connection we had was we were both women and we ran the election and we were first time counselors. So we understood the struggle we went through. And the way we can be good ally for our other counselor is uh, if you see something wrong, stand up and say it. And that happens, and Barbara, you know, you have been, you were in politics for a long time and you have seen stuff. And, and you know what, you're inspirational because you know what, it's amazing having strong women like you paving the way for younger generation is great. And I, I'm hoping to do the same thing for next generation. And another important thing we can do is lift each other up. 
not to push each other down, each other down, just lift each other up and celebrate each other's achievement. Be positive and just being a good all round great person and welcoming person that just makes a big deal. And, you know, we have come a long way since you were probably became counselor 20 years ago. Now we have lots of female counselors and there's lots of women in the senior roles at the city hall. So we, it is improving slowly, slowly, but we have to con keep the con success going. It's like slowly, slow and steady, because we have to continue going. The slow and steady wins the race. So we have to encourage other women. We have to lift them up and to be there to support them any way possible we can. That's how we can help each other. Thanks, Mona. I appreciate your comments. So Carrie, would you yeah. like to this question? Sure, I guess I will say that there's so many reasons why it's important to be um, a good ally, um, to support diversity and diverse people and women um, to run for council. It, I mean, if you love your city and your community, you will fundamentally believe that, um, you know, it's not about you, it's about us and the more representation that we have, as Kevin said, the better decisions we make as a collective. So it's, it's putting the, I think it's putting, being a good ally is, is your, your, it's not just about you, you're putting your um, community first and checking your biases. Um, being a good ally for me, if, if you were say a male counselor and you're, you're serving on council, you might fundamentally disagree with some of the, the women on council um, on some issues. You might not even like them, um, but it's important um, that you try and recognize when you are participating in acts of misogyny and everybody can participate in upholding um, systems of oppression or misogyny. Women participate in, in um, keeping the patriarchal structures the way they are. We can all participate in any kind of system of oppression. We have to all recognize it. Um, but it's important that you keep uh, things political and you're, you make political arguments and you don't participate in things behind the scenes, behind council um, that can get ugly. Those kinds of things can happen sometimes in the political arena, whether it's in um, a, a, any kind of municipal election, it can happen around the council table or behind the scenes and it, it does happen. So just checking yourself is a good thing. Um, I don't expect my council colleagues to um, fix everything. And, and I honestly didn't experience a lot of misogyny. I experienced uh, sexism in, in my life. And I think when you're a woman and you work in um, certain industries, you just expect things and you, you're able to roll with it. But when you take a seat at the table and you get into a, a position of power and you're in a, a position where it's traditionally been held by men, things change a little bit. And so for the first time, I experienced a different kind of, I can't call it sex, sexism, but I, I, I would call it misogyny or being put in your place. Um, and these were hard experiences because I honestly had never felt anything like this before. And I thought that I had gone through a lot in my life. I thought I was prepared for it, but I honestly wasn't. What was helpful was when my uh, council colleague in my ward, Matt Sisko, would, he's, who's now mayor, when he would see it happening and recognize that, wow, when I say this, this doesn't happen. But when you talk to this person like this, this is what happens. Even just recognizing um, what was happening was helpful and supportive. And a few of my council colleagues uh, were very good at that and, and sort of affirmed that, yeah, I see this happening as well. I don't expect, didn't expect everybody to fix everything. These were just um, experiences we had. And there were lots of examples of, you know, talking to a resident and how if I delivered a message, it was taken a certain way. And when he delivered a message, it, we, you know, it came on some more authority, even though we said the exact same thing. Um, you can be an ally in very simple ways by just even acknowledging um, something happening in front of you that you notice, but just by paying attention 
And um, that just really goes a long way because you can tend to feel crazy um, when you notice things, just like the little biases or um, what I found sitting on council is I, I sometimes noticed some of my colleagues would question female staff more or differently than, than male staff. They'd sort of accept the report from the male staff. You called, if you tried to call them on it, they, I don't think they would even recognize it. Um, but just acknowledging that those things happen and they exist, having the space to talk about it, um, it does help and it goes a long way. So I did, you know, I went through some struggles on my time as a, as a counselor, but I ultimately had a great experience, uh, all things considered. It was one of the best experiences of my life. And I did have a lot of support from my male colleagues, um, which I'm grateful for. Thanks, Carrie. I can really identify with what a lot of what you talked about. I too felt very blessed to have some wonderful allies in both men and women. It, 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 did, it did make it a lot easier to have that going forward. So the fourth question is for Mona and Carrie. How can counselors support and advocate for women and gender diverse constituents, including those from diverse backgrounds? Yeah. Actually, the way we can now, uh, one of the reason women and especially people from uh, women from minority do not come, do not step forward in the political life is because most of the time there's a fear. I had fear myself. Are you going to fit in? Are you made for the life? Because you're not used to seeing people, especially if you're from minority group who look like you in the leadership position. And even after I won the election, winning the election was the hardest part. But after I won the election, I actually was very worried before our first meeting. I was worried that, am I going to treat, be treated equal? Are people going to take me seriously? Am I going to be respected? And I, it was all in my mind. Uh, my colleagues, the staff, oh, they were more welcoming than I could ever imagine, all of them. They never made me feel any different than anyone. It was all in my mind. But still, when we go some places, I still feel like, no, this is not the place I'm supposed to be because there's nobody else there who looks like me. So the way I would see it, yeah, well, the way I would say it, how to help your women and uh, gender, uh, not gender, sorry, diverse people is when we have GNCC lunch, when we have certain big events, we should invite leaders from other minority groups to come and see how it's not a very scary world. You know what, we are all people. People see people as a people and that's that's what I have found because you know there's good and bad in everyone. I have gotten really bad side of people too, but I have seen very good in people too. So once people come into the events, then what a political life is supposed to be, once they experience that, then they will, feel, they will understand that it's not as scary as they see it is because I think women can make great leaders because just look what's happening in the world around us. Most of the conflicts are happening because of the men, because you know, men do have ego except my husband. And if my fellow counselors are listening, except my fellow counselors and my husband, they don't have ego, they are good men. <laughs> but men have egos and, they, and women will more likely go across the aisle and try to work with the other side because that's the way we have that's the way women work. You know, in our family, we always try to make everyone happy. So as a woman, we don't, we always try to work with others. So can you imagine if we had more women leader in the world right now? I think half the conflict will be resolved because women will be in a leadership role. So women can do much better than men. I'm not saying men are not great, but you know, women do have different perspective to most of the problems. They do have different solution than what men have. So women, and especially if they're from diverse background, because you know everybody's raised differently. We all have same principles we grew up with, but different perspective can bring uh, great uh, solutions, right? Lots of problems. And uh, the way to encourage uh, other women and other diverse min uh, minority group women to step forward is we should start an internship program for younger girls to get involved in the politics. When we start at the young age, then they are very curious. And that's how they uh, get involved in the politics. And some of the barriers women do face is they don't have financial backing as men do when they wanna run for office. 
So maybe we can have grants or maybe offer them interest-free loans. And we have lots of uh, students who work in a, who go to school for political science. Maybe we can give them a volunteer hours or community hours to help women to run their campaign. Because you know what? Uh, running a campaign is not an easy thing because you have a plan, but every day unfolds something new. Because election is a very gruesome process and you have to have the support system. And that is the one reason lots of people do not want to run. But if we provide them that support, and lots of women have younger children, like uh, Carrie said, she had a younger kids when she was a, she was running for the counselor. Provide them small help, like community coming together to babysit the kids or provide homemade meals. There's lots of support that goes behind a one candidate who runs for the election. So if we provide this uh, support to women and even a people from minority, I think we'll see lots more people stepping forward to run for political office. Thank you, Mona. Carrie, you want to give, a, give us a shot? Thanks. Um, yeah, Mona covered a lot. I think uh, funding is important. It, they've done studies and it takes an, for a woman to be asked seven times to run for office before she'll agree to it, where it would take a man one time. So um, asking, asking and asking women to run, um, listening to um, all of the reasons why they would have a struggle to run and, and, and helping get behind them um, and advocating for um, you know, a better political life um, for everybody, that's for women in politics, but it will ultimately, ultimately be for everybody um, is really important. There's little things that, that you can do if sending a text message or a message of random text message of support to one of your um, counselors who you you know is doing a good job we often um, I, I think as women we often just hear the the criticism and the negativity and we we uh, in, with social media it can get overwhelming and it's become a toxic environment for all politicians right now um, regardless of who we are it's very it's very very challenging to serve in these times um, where people are very entrenched and there's a lot of toxicity on social media so uh, helping strategize uh, with women who are thinking about running and worried about um, you know, how am I going to do this? How would I deal with this criticism? What about my family? What about safety concerns? Um, providing those types of like concrete supports and getting teams together, um, I think goes a long way. And, it, you know, we all talked about why this is important. And I, I feel like sometimes when we talk about getting more women in politics, it it's, might feel like a threat um, to people around the table. But I, I think at the end of the day, there's been so many studies done in so many great cities and places in the world that have a diversity, lots of economic and political participation by women. Those are great cities, great countries. So we all need to invest to do this. It's very important to kind of step out outside of ourselves. I think um, supporting women to run concretely um, it, you know, with advice, money, support is is one thing, but there's also things that counselors can do and, and the community can do around the table to look at some of the good things that other cities are doing, like Barcelona, in terms of how they're doing their budgeting, the kinds of committees that a council uh, sets up to advise council. It, it, it really speaks to the council's priorities. And if you're sitting around the table with a lot of men and they, they get it, they understand the need that, you know, we need to have a women's committee. We need to hear from these groups. We need to have, we need to hear from people with disabilities. We need to hear from the trans community. We need to hear from black indigenous people of color. We want them at the table. It creates a safer space for us uh, just to be in and uh, having an open mind and looking at looking at the concrete amazing things that cities are doing when they do things like um, collect data and metrics and do gender-based budgeting and um, take into consideration women's feedback in planning decisions and city building initiatives, building parks, safety. There's so many concrete reasons why it's important to support women in politics. It's not it's not just because we want to have power and be at the table. We, I fundamentally be, believe that this diversity um, would make Niagara 
it would put us so much further ahead. Um, so we all have a role and we should all invest in it. Thanks, Carrie. Very well said. All right. So I want to thank the panelists. Um, don't go away because you're not done yet. Um, at this point in time, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, Walter Senzik became the youngest mayor in St. Catherine's history in 2014, the start of eight years of service. During his time in office, he worked towards creating a better culture in City Hall and the St. Catherine's community and launched the Compassionate City Initiative. Former Mayor Senzik has launched his own company since leaving office, focusing on pathways to solutions and how to avoid becoming stopped by optical obstacles to success. And he can be heard on 610 CKTB radio, The Drive, which airs on weekdays from 2 to 6 p.m. Really glad to see you, Walter. Uh, one thing I learned about uh, Walter when sitting on council with him that he always said what he meant and meant what he said, which I can tell you, um, I always had respect for always. So welcome, Walter. Thanks, Barbara. It is great to see you again. We were having lunch on a wonderful patio in Welland a couple of days ago. Great to catch up and I miss seeing you around council as well as Mayor, former Mayor Gibson, uh, Kevin, you were my seatmate. We sat beside each other. We shared a, a lot of stories. I learned a lot from you for an individual who was in the, in the police services. You provided a perspective that I wasn't aware of in terms of your abilities to pull apart some significant issues and, and give a different perspective. So I really valued our our uh, seating arrangements. And Thank was, you very much, Walter. Very kind words. It was great to see you. And Carrie, I'll get to you in a few minutes. Um, we spent a lot of time on council. And Mona, congratulations on your election. Great to see you around different community events. And you're very engaged, which is amazing to see. So um, Cassie, thanks for the invite. It's great to, to be here. Just came off of 610 CKTB, The Drive. Um, I'm Walter Senzik. It's going to be sunny out today. It's going to be a high of 22 tomorrow. Wear your sun, sunscreen if you're out and about. Weekend's looking a bit cloudy with uh, some chance of rain maybe on Sunday. So there you go. I can do the weather now. Who thought I could do actually do the weather? Anyway, it is a, it's an opportunity for me to stay engaged. And I say that because I'm able to have these kind of conversations as well with the broader public. And so today we were talking about Brock University's diversity, equity, and inclusion blueprint that they just released and really got to go deeper into why is that blueprint important, not just for the college as an institution, but for the community as well. And that's what I love about being able to be on radio is it gives us the opportunities to have further discussions. And so today I was asked to talk about how to be a champion for women. So I'm just gonna frame it around five people. And the five people I'm gonna frame it around are Julie Rorison, who was the chief of staff in the mayor's office, Shelly Chemnitz, who is the CAO of the city of St. Catharines, Carrie and Lori Littleton, two outstanding counselors that I had the absolute honor to serve with. And then Narai Kapazavanu is an individual that I'd like to share the story because the meeting where we connected was foundational for me as a mayor, but then being able to work with Narai and, and go through different programming and then see her now as a police board member, amazing. So I'm just gonna talk about the five women and show how, from my perspective, how being a champion can have an impact and what it does for the, the, greater, the greater good. So Julie came into my office in 2014 after I got elected and she was an unknown. So it was between her and another individual for the position. The other individual I knew, 
it's I knew the family. I knew he was very well educated um, and had all the attributes that, yeah, this is an individual that I think I can work with because I knew who he was and I knew his family. With Julie, I didn't know anything about her in terms of the background, except for what was on her, her resume. And I knew that she worked for the city of Burlington. And so the differentiation was she had the experience that we needed in an office because I was a first time politician. I'd never sat around a council table. So I was coming in with not a, I came in with no, no playbook on how to be an effective mayor, how to be an effective communicator, how to work in a larger work environment like the city. So bringing her on in a situation where it would have been easier to go with the person I knew was the back, actually the best decision I made because with her in that position, a, a very bright woman, her, her convictions are very strong and she pushed the mayor's office in a way that um, was probably outside of the norm for the mayor's office at the time. So she came from the YW, she was sitting on the board of the YW and she had a lot more progressive approaches to how government and the intersection between residents and council and between council and staff, how that could actually make for a stronger community. And so working with her, she actually became the catalyst for some of the initiatives that have become foundational for the city. And it was interesting because one of the stories that were, we shared over time was when she would sit around the staff table, because we would have internal staff meetings with the senior team. If I wasn't in the meeting, she wasn't listened to. And so, we would have discussions about these meetings afterwards and she was frustrated. She's, unless you're in those meetings, they just, they tune me out, they talk over me. It's not a welcoming environment. So with that information, met with our senior team and I said, when Julie's at the seat, she's my voice. So if you're gonna disrespect her, you're disrespecting me. If you're not gonna listen to her, you're disrespecting the office because she's there as a representative of the mayor and She's the one who's helping to move the, the, the agenda forward, if you will. And after having that conversation, she was more welcomed into that situation, more welcomed into those meetings. And she was being, she was feeling as if she was an equal at the table. She deserved to be there. It's just because of a title, that's where she wasn't being welcomed because I had the title, she didn't until the people around the table recognize that she's actually a voice of the office. So matter, no matter if you're a female mayor or a male mayor, the people representing you need to know that you're empowering them to speak for you when they're in situations that you're not there. And you gotta give them the confidence to be in those positions. You gotta give them, and I remember many conversations about you're, you have a strong voice. We've talked about these issues as, as a staff, meaning internal mayor staff. You're my voice when you go into those tapes. Feel, the, feel the, the strength to do and say what you need to say. And so having that ability to encourage an individual to take themselves out of a comfort zone, to put them in places where they can develop further further um, strengths in their abilities is something that we regularly did. Now, it was because of her being in that position that she was able to apply for a seat at the table. Now, this iteration of what we're seeing here started in St. Catharines. If I didn't hire Julie Rorison and she wasn't the chief of staff and she didn't go through the that, that growth of being given the responsibility and knowing that she can make these kind of decisions, the seat at the table wouldn't exist. It was because of her application to FCM that created the conditions for us to create a program with the Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce to actually have something that I think became very unique and has now grown into a regional seat at the table. And I remember the first iterations of it 
and and Carrie, you were there. Lori was there. Don Dodge, uh, Laura Laura Yip uh, was was in there as well. Shelly Chemnitz was there. Bonnie uh, Bonnie Dunk was there. Nitso Dunk, and seeing this 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 very dynamic and amazing group of people being able to be a part of something that then worked with the external community really created, I think, the, 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 the embers, if you will, of what we're experiencing here today. And so I can, I can draw back to my first decision, which has translated into so much growth and opportunity because that individual had the, the, the abilities and the, the, the space was being created for that tremendous amount of growth. Now I go to Shelley Chemnitz and Shelley had worked for the city of St. Catharines for 30 years, graduate of Brock University, financial background, an amazing person who accomplished a lot. The one piece that wasn't there yet was her ability to be the CAO of the city of St. Catharines. That opportunity created itself and it was between her and two other men for the position. And as a council, we went through a, a lot of deliberation about that. But I can say that seeing her and her ability to lead, she leads in a different way, but in her ability to lead, what I mean by different way is I had seen how the previous CAO led and I had been aware of the previous CAO before that. And they had both men had very, um, very, distinctive leadership styles that I wouldn't call aggressive, but um, there weren't what I would say as being progressive. And Shelly did a great interview. She had the experience and thankfully a majority of council chose Shelly to be the first CAO for the city of St. Catharines, giving me the opportunity to work with another strong female and in that space, be able to learn from Shelly, but at the same time, being in a, in, a, in a working relationship where she is much more empathetic, she is much more, her approach and decision-making are methodical. Um, Carrie would know I sometimes am not methodical. <laughs> I have a, a sometimes a different, and Barb and Kevin, you've seen it at Regional Council. So there was that balance to be able to, to learn. And I will say, going into the pandemic, she was the perfect leader for the city of St. Catharines. Very, her approach was very measured. Uh, again, it was methodical and it really balanced out what was a very chaotic time at the beginning of the pandemic. And she instilled in the staff and working with me in the community, the sense of, we got this, like we, we're, we're gonna get through this. We're gonna do it together. And that was learning from her. And so being able to be beside somebody, because for those who don't know where we sit at, at, we at city council, we have the CAO sitting beside the, the mayor of St. Catharines. And so being able to sit beside and, and be able to work collaboratively, co collaboratively together, you know, we under Shelley's leadership signed a, leadership accord on gender diversity and that was with a lecture we were the second municipality in canada to sign that accord and we were able to sign it i, I believe this because people like shelly were were doing the heavy lifting as well 42 percent of our senior management team are women or at least were men, women when i was when i was mayor of st Catharines, and that was that was something that made that leadership accord real we were, we were living the tenets of that accord, which was to improve opportunities for women. It was through uh, mentoring, career progression, training. We were, we were establishing that framework and it was because of someone like Shelly that we were able to progress our community in a way that I don't believe we would have progressed if we had another individual in there that didn't have those skill sets. And so those two, Right. Shelly and, and, and Julie Rorson were on the internal side of the city. It's working with them, but then giving both of them the opportunity, the space. You know, being a CAO is not an easy job. And it really stretched Shelly, but she proved to everybody that she was more than capable of being in that position. I was absolutely proud of that. 
And then going to my council colleagues and, and Carrie and, and Lori, and I'll start with Lori because Carrie's on the, the call here. Both were new to council. And so I was in my second term and Lori and Carrie both got elected in the second term. And working with Lori, I knew about her because she was a reporter. Uh, she was also a former reporter with the daily newspapers. And she was also a, a financial investor. So I got to know her a bit, but really working with her and meeting with her and learning what she wanted to accomplish as a, a counselor, what her passion and convictions were, knowing that, you know, for the first meeting, she was very good at articulating and disseminating and reading reports and getting into the core of the issue, knowing that I can lean on her for both input and guidance on issues because I knew she was putting a lot of the, the heavy lifting into the reading of the reports and she was great working with the community. She was amazing in her ward. She was really connected to her community. She made it really easy for me in my position to know that a person like her was representing her ward. And Carrie, interestingly enough, um, came into our working relationship. And I think Carrie and I both came into it probably thinking um, this person's not going to be aligned with anything that I do. So it was probably going to be some, you know, some, some, some splitting here. Uh, but what I discovered about Carrie right at the very beginning is it's, it's not about a political position. It's about what's best for the community. And she spoke so she spoke with so much conviction about wanting to help people. And she wasn't afraid of using her voice. I didn't, she was never afraid of using her voice, which is, and I use the word afraid because there was no timidness in having a conversation with her. It was very, this is what I believe in. This is where I think we can go. How do we get there? It was always a, how do we get to, the solution? How do we get to a position where we're helping either a member in, in, my, in my ward or we're making the city a better city? And the championing part, as we, as I was listening to the panel, um, the mansplaining happens more than I think people know. And the mansplaining is when, and I think we all know what it is here, but when a counselor like Counselor Porter would say something, and then you would have a male counselor hand goes up and says, well, I think what Counselor Porter was saying was this. And you're like, um, she's capable of speaking for herself. Like, what, 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 I don't understand why you're reiterating and saying, and to me, that was the signal that I think the women who have been in politics get where people are men seem to think that women need to when they say something, someone else has to reiterate it for it to be true. And that was the early discussions with Councillor Porter and Councillor Littleton is really trying to get counsel beyond that sort of um, masculine way of, of interacting because it was, it was so driven for so many years by that kind of old school, I'll use the word old school, bo old boys club mentality. And it was, wasn't easy. And I, I, I had a lot of conversations and I think this is a key one. Um, Councillor Littleton and Councillor Porter spoke at my, my final event uh, at the Performing Arts Center and they talked about listening. Now, uh, I'm on the radio, so I tend to talk a lot. But what I didn't recognize is that I also, I also listened. And I say the word, I didn't recognize it because it's, to me, it's a natural inclination. So if I could, if I can give anybody advice, it's really focus on the listening part of a conversation rather than the continuous talking. And I, I think Mayor Gibson, you and I would appreciate this as mayors is, is, is people want to hear you talking about what's going on. And many times, I don't think there's, we give the, we, we give the space for actually just listening to our colleagues, listening to our community around us. And as males, I think a lot of men still have trouble with that kind of listening that is more than just yeah, but. People can listen, but when you get a yeah, but, that means they're not really listening. They're, they're already processing their rebuttal or 
They're already, and that type of listening is not conducive to actually making people feel as if their, 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 their positioning, their distillation, distillation of the conversation is actually valid. So I think the listening is a key and that's something that I really learned a lot from Councillor Porter and, and Councillor Littleton. And, and Councillor Littleton went on to be budget chair. Uh, Councillor Porter represented the, the city at, um, at uh, AMO, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. She would meet with ministers, meaning she has areas of expertise that you need to go and, and talk to this minister about what actually the city is, is needing. So it's again, going back to the empowering piece trying to find ways and means that if we're going to be a champion, there has to be an, a level of empowerment, but also an ability to listen and to create the space for personal growth. If you're, if you're doing that on a regular basis and you're in a position like mayor or chair or committee chair or board chair, the people around you will do amazing things. They will respond in an amazing way. And then Naraya Kapasavanu, uh, an amazing individual and the, and the story I tell about Narai is I was at one of it was at the um, uh, Black Excellence Awards for Niagara it was at the Stone Mill Inn in Meriton and this is before the pandemic and there was I think there was there was three white people in the in the group in the whole in the whole ballroom and Narai went up and gave a speech and actually I went up first and I did my old I'm the mayor and Da, 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 da. and welcomed everybody and, and you know wanted to wanted to to be inclusive and and have some words and then Narai got up and boy did she challenge she challenged me and she challenged Chris Biddle and she challenged the police police chief of police and she was like look around the room why are you the only three white people here what's going on and like this is not an inclusive city like why aren't more business people here from the white community like what, and, and it was, this is what systemic racism looks like. This is what lack of inclusion looks like. And, I, and I, this was the early iterations of me understanding diversity, equity, and inclusion. So afterwards, I, I went up to her and I said, hey, hi, Narai, and my name's Walter. And she's like, I know who you are. <laughs> That's the way she talks, I love it. She's very direct. And um, I said, I'd like to learn more because you know it, it seems like I'm, I'm not doing enough. Like, well, what more can I do? And she goes, well, um, I'll have a meeting at your office if you'll even call me. So, okay, so I went back and sent her an email and we set up a, a thing and she came into the office, she goes, I'm surprised that you actually did that. She goes, I thought you were just talking to me, I thought you were just asking me something because it made you feel good. And I was like, no, no, you know, let, let's have a discussion. And she was very direct about how she and her kids and the, the, the black community feel in Niagara. And she's part of Toes Niagara. And, she wanted, she, want, she wanted to start a, a black mentorship, youth black mentorship program, and she couldn't get any inroads into DSBN or the Catholic board. And so she said, okay, can you help me do this? And so I said, yep, no problem. Open the door and made the calls. And then she said, can you come to the, the meetings with me? And I said, well, why do you want, like, okay, but why? And she goes, I'm walking into these meetings with white men and white men don't listen to black women. And I was like, wow, okay. She goes, I need you there. Okay. So we went in and every meeting, amazing was like she, and she ended up starting the Youth Black Mentorship Program. Niagara Community Foundation is a supporter, is a, is a, is a financial provider for it. It is an amazing mentorship program. And then from there, our relationship has continued to grow. She's continued to inform me about how I can be a better ally, how I can make a difference in the larger community. And then the opportunity for Niagara Regional Police came along. And I remember she called and she goes, what do you think? Am I capable of doing this? I'm like, what? You are more than capable. You've been working on humans, human trafficking globally. You travel around the world for it. You have Toes Niagara, you developed a youth mentor, black mentorship program. Are you kidding me? And it was this feeling of she's not still not good enough to be in a position to like that. And so for me, it was just validating 
that no, she is more than capable of sitting at that table. She filled out the application. She went through the interview process. It was all her. She did it all herself. And it was just the ability to be able to say, you can do this. You are more than capable of doing this. And that's what I think being a champion is. I think a champion is being able to lift up. It's being able to listen. It's being able to create space. It's being able to become uncomfortable. If, you know, you know in a situation where I'm in a room and a person has pretty much said, you know, what you're doing is all wrong. You're not inclusive. The knee-jerk reaction could be just to be like, I'm a walk out of the room, never go back to an event like that. And it was like, no, like the, being able to listen, being able to say, this is uncomfortable for me, but what can I do to make it better? Because I clearly need to learn something more. And that individual is where I need to learn more from. So being able to be uncomfortable yourself as a male, to step outside of your comfort zone, to be in spaces where you don't, where you feel, where you're going to feel insecure, where you're going to feel uncomfortable. Those are all the places and ways to make, to, to create the conditions for being a champion. So it's not just the external, how do you create the space? It's the internal piece of how do I, how do I put myself in uncomfortable positions so that women, members of the BIPOC community, the indigenous community, that we can advance their, we can advance the, the abilities for them to make a difference in our larger community. If we do that right, if we put aside those kind of insecurities that we as men have, I actually think a lot of great things will happen because again, we can open up doors, uh, but we need to be strong advocates. We need to create the space, we need to be better listeners because I will, I will say I'm a terrible listener at times and I'm getting, I'm still learning. I will continuously learn until, um, you know, I get the call, tap on the shoulder, and I go to another world, wherever that's going to happen. So being a continuous learner and an opportunity to be uncomfortable, I think, is the keys to being a champion. So I'll leave it at that. If there's any questions, um, feel free to, to jump in. And yeah, it's been an honor to be here. And if it wasn't for my experience as mayor, I wouldn't know Barb. I wouldn't know Kevin. I wouldn't know uh, Counselor. Well, I wouldn't know Carrie. He's a very good friend. I wouldn't know Lori. Um, there's a lot of people I wouldn't know. So I'm better because of all of you. And Mona, I will get to know you. You'll be on my show. I'll get you on 610. <laughs> Walter, thank you. Thank you. Walter. Walter, thank you so much. Uh, I would say that you were absolutely blessed to be surrounded by such incredible women and also blessed with the ability to listen and hear what they had to say to you so that you could then play your part in acting on it. Um, I told you yes, or yesterday, the other day when we were together, that you're probably one of the more progressive um, mayors that I've come across in a long, long time. And I really give you credit. Um, obviously surrounding yourself by these kind of people, um, that, that, was, that was certainly the ticket to get. 100%, to get that. well said, well said. Yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, you're, I love your remarks. You're just candid and from your heart and that's, that's what makes you you, I guess. <laughs> yes, there's one question right now. And uh, definitely if there are any other questions, um, I think you should be able, the participants should be able to put their hands up. And I, I do have the opportunity to unmute you. Um, so if you are interested in asking a question directly, please let me know. Uh, the one question that is here is, is it possible to be a politician and not participate in social media? I can, I, I will take a stab at that. Uh, some of my colleagues have been on council for a while and they they um, got to know the community before social media. So they, they were campaigning and they are not interested. Um, so I think if you were a current sitting politician, uh, like a municipal councillor and you've never used social media and you have other ways of being in touch with your um, residents, it's possible. But I think if you were just starting out, it'd be very challenging to run a campaign. Um, and social media is a, a double-edged sword. You can actually reach people. It can be very accessible for 
uh, people to run a campaign with little money using social media. So in one way, it 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 can help um, get more people involved and help uh, get exposure. It's, it, it can be affordable if you if you kind of know what you're doing. It's also very toxic and um, you know, I think society is, is going to have to figure out how to how to manage uh, social media at some point. So I think if you're just starting out in politics, it would be very challenging um, to not participate in social media. And it is really a way to reach your residents and talk to them and tell them what's going on. Like my my parents are on Facebook. You know, people of all ages and demographics are really on social media. So. Um, cities use it to reach people. So it, it's kind of an expectation that politicians are on it. Um, I think the unfortunate thing with the part-time council role is we don't have staff to help us filter. When I worked for a, an MP and an MPP, we would filter the social media. We would re respond to emails. We would deal with the nasty emails. So they were, in a sense, protected from um, some of the vitriol, but as municipal councillors were on the front line and we didn't have um, staff to help with that. Thanks, Carrie. Mona, did you want to comment on that? <clears throat> yes. Uh, and this goes for my comment for social media is if you're a new upcoming politician or if you're running a local office, social media can help you a lot. In my case, from my experience, I can say, me being a new person, I was not born and raised in Niagara Falls, so not too many people knew who I was. Uh, lots of my other uh, fellow counselors, they do not use social media because they have been here for few, like two or three generations. They went to school with people in the city, so they know who they are. So in my case, social media helped people to understand who I was, my family, what I do. And just to see me as a person, when they look at my pictures and my history, they understand what kind of person I am. So social media does help you to get your message out there. But as Carrie said, and so if you're going to use the social media, you have to have thick skin. Because you know what? There's going to be lots of aggression out there. Not too many comments are such a great comments. And during my election or nowadays, I don't. Sometimes I do not go through my social media and I don't see the comments. I always have friends and families telling like, oh, somebody's making these comments about you, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, uh, you have to have thick skin. And I think if you want to get into politics, that's the one must have is a thick skin. Thanks, Mona. Thank you. Kevin, you got your hand up. I know you're aching to get into this. Yes, not too much. It's already been said by Mona and uh, Carrie, but... Um, the only piece of advice there, I would say, is, yeah, you, you have to use it. People expect you to use it. And it's the only way to truly connect. Uh, the only little piece of advice I, I would give is uh, before you hit the send button, have somebody of a cool mind <laughs> in a neutral position, take a read of it. Uh, or, you know, it's like a, that hot email that goes out and then you look at it the next day and you go, oh my God, what have I done? So um, it's, uh, when I was in the uh, office there, I was very careful about that and I would filter it through different people. And lots of times I did, I wouldn't send it the office. It would come from the township itself. So uh, is it needed? Yeah, but you got to be careful for sure. So thank you. Thank Thanks, Kevin. If I had a nickel for every one I didn't send, boy, oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> Walter, did you want, Walter, did you want to jump in too? No? Okay. Cassie, was there other questions? No, there's no other questions. Um, I don't know if there's uh, any questions any of the panelists want to pose to uh, each other. Oh, that's an idea. Go ahead, Mona. I do have a question for all four of you, because you know you guys have been in office, uh, including Cassie, Barb, Kevin, and Walter. What advice would you give me as a new counselor? Walter? It's, that's a great question. I, I would, hmm. it, 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 it's a hard one. Uh, and I mean hard because it's the dynamic of, of being on council. Uh, don't be afraid of using your voice. Four years goes by really fast. So finding your, finding your ability to, to 
be at the table and I, I'm not at regional. I mean, I, I'm not at city council in Niagara Falls. So I don't know the dynamic of it, but making sure that your, um, your voice is being heard. Um, it can be a challenge at times when you're in certain dynamics. And so not being afraid to reach out to other people, which you were talking about already doing. I think there's some great mentors out there. Find a mentor in the, in the, but I, I would look at both a mentor within the municipality as a corporate structure, and then also look from a political perspective, look for a, a mentor that can help balance the trickiness of how you feel about yourself as a counselor, because as counselor Porter, I, 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 and I think, you know, in our relationship, being able to see like there, there's, there, there's a confluence and a continuous confliction of feelings because you're dealing with so many different issues and you're juggling a whole bunch of things. If you don't have an ability to um, bounce that off of someone who's gone through those experiences, uh, you know, internalizing that is not going to be healthy for you. It's not going to be healthy for your family. And I don't think it makes you an effective counselor. So that would be my advice is, is look for some mentorship, both internally, because if you have someone who you can talk to inside the corporation of the city, they can help give you perspective about what's going on in the city. And then the political realm, having somebody that you can speak to really gives you two, two perspectives that I think um, a first time counselor could really benefit from. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. I'll Gary? jump in. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Kevin. Oh, sorry. Was somebody else there or? No, um, I, very, very simply, um, the motto I went by, uh, uh, be honest with people. People people know when you're not being honest. And I've seen examples, we've all seen examples of that over the last four or five years where politicians have been uh, trying to, to sell a story and everybody knows. Um, that's really important, Mona. Uh, be communicative, as Walter said, just put it out there and people appreciate honesty. And I think that's a really important component of being a politician uh, that's not expected by people, uh, by the public anymore. So I think that's an important part. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Carrie, do you want to add in? I would say, uh, take opportunities to go. If you're, I don't know if you're going to go to AMO this year, um, go to the AMO conference and network, uh, with other counselors. I, um, I developed some relationships uh, with other counselors. Um, there's a couple of female counselors in the city of Hamilton and we would message back and forth a lot. It was uh, Narendra Nan and Maureen Wilson. And there were a couple of um, female politicians across Ontario. I, I got to know them on social media and um, there was some support there from outside. Um, I also had a support network um, inside of, of council and with some um, female regional counselors. I leaned on staff we did have gender parity almost in terms of the senior leadership team in the city of St. Catharines. I felt that was very, I was very fortunate and it made for a better experience for me um, given all the challenges. There wasn't a gender parity on council, but we had it amongst the senior leadership team. So I lean on staff. If I could do things differently, I would have, there were times where it was really challenging and I would call Walter upset about things and the armor will chip uh, the, the thick skin will at some point so just build this support and try to keep your kids away from <laughs> um the discussions i think that was if i could change i'm sorry i'm crying but if there was one thing i could have done differently and uh maybe it was covid but all of the the I had a tough day job dealing with um, homelessness and landlords and eviction. So my, my children were hearing my work conversations and then they were hearing my council conversations during COVID because everything was at home. And I love politics a lot still, um, you know, even through all the tough times and I want them to love politics as well and have to have a good outlook. So if you're, if you've got a family I'm just trying, I didn't understand how affected they were by the things that they were hearing that I was like, they were just overhearing in the house. Um, so 
if you want to sustain a, a career in politics, if you're a woman, it, you do have to consider uh, your family. And, and if you're going to stay in it, they need to be okay. So uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting to get upset, but if that's the piece of advice I have is, is just to watch that, uh, get the support because there are times you can have the thickest skin possible, but you never know when it, some things can chip away at you. And sometimes people will do it intentionally. Um, it, they, they really will, unfortunately. And I think that's the, the hardest thing is when uh, it's one thing to experience of random acts of, you know, sexism and, there's stuff you come to expect, but then there are other times when you're just, you're kind of shocked by what can happen in, in the political realm. And it can be really um, shocking and disheartening. So, but building that level of support um, is really important to go to AMO. And um, there's so many exciting um, things you can do as a counselor. It's such a great learning opportunity and just take advantage of it uh, while you're doing it because um the good really does outweigh the bad. Um, it's, it, it is tough. I'm, I'm not a person of color. I'm not a woman of color. And so your experiences are probably going to be different and possibly more challenging than mine. Mm -hmm. um, but finding support is crucial. And I'm glad to meet you online. I hope I get to meet you in person. And congratulations. I'm, I'm really glad you're, you're elected in Niagara Falls. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, Carrie. We're all sending you a big hug. Yeah. So for me, I would say um, always be really well prepared for your for your meetings, but also don't be afraid to trust your gut instinct because a lot of times, you know, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, sounds like a duck, it's probably a duck. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Your your own gut instinct, I think, um, at least for me, didn't ever really steer me too far wrong. And sometimes I don't even know where that. It's like, it's, it's almost intuitive for me that if it's somebody that I'm thinking, holy smokes, that guy is, or that person is, su he's telling such big fat lies, I can't even believe it. And I don't, and I, the information just filters through, I guess. And, and, and so that was like instinctual as opposed to sometimes anything else. And I, I suppose that sounds weird. And I, and I don't care if it sounds weird because it just happens to be the truth of it. Your gut instinct is a really important part of who you are and trust it. Absolutely trust it. The other thing is surround yourself with good, strong, trustworthy people, whether that be within your family circle, if you're lucky enough to have that in your council circle, whatever that looks like. Surround yourself by, with, with those kind of folks that you can trust and, and you know they have your back. And be really careful who comes into that circle. Because as Terry said, there are wolves in sheep's clothing out there. That's where it goes back to your gut instinct. So don't be afraid to trust that gut instinct. And some people poo-poo it away. And, and I think like all kinds of th other things like data and, and research and all the things, all that stuff matters. But what's in your heart and what's in your gut sometimes can be the deciding factor um, in making a good decision or a really bad decision or a great decision, right? Because, I mean, the passion that we all feel that we, when we do this kind of a job, you don't do it for the money. That's for mm -hmm. sure, right? Yeah. You're not doing it for the money. You're doing it because you care about a community. You care about where you live. You care about, you know, your town, your region, whatever that is. And you want to contribute in a positive way and you want to somehow leave it a little bit better than where you found it. And I think that's kind of, that certainly was what always motivated me. You want to help people, mm -hmm. you know, helping people is like kind of like the big, like, especially for a city councilor. Region is a little more, a bit further removed, I think. At least that's how I found it to be. It's more about policy and it's more, it's more removed. But mm -hmm. being a city councilor, totally the best totally the best best job you can do so that would be my advice for you my dear good luck you're you're, you. you're in the right place at the exact right time i'm really happy you're there
Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate the answer. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, we've so gone over. Pick it up. You know, we've gone over time a little bit. I think Ashley had um, their hand up. I'm gonna see if that works. To hi. Can you hear me? Question. Yes, we can. It wasn't really a question, it was a statement. And I just wanted to thank Carrie for being vulnerable and for being raw and real. And don't apologize because you are an inspiration to me when I ran. I have young kids. I knew what was going, um, I knew what your family was going through at that time. And there needs to be better protections for every level of anyone running and candidates and elected officials, because it really does promote fear within a community that there can be such vile and hateful acts uh, against people. And because you're emotional or you're showing that you care, it isn't something that you should apologize for because it shows that you're a real life person <laughs> and it makes the rest of us feel like we can be authentic and that we can also be vulnerable and uh, we can affect change in our community in positive ways. So thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you so much, Ashley. And I just want my kids are doing well and they're uh, resilient and there's things that we did to try and um, get them through the pandemic and, you know, pass some of the experiences. And my my husband texted me that my son just got a promotion in Sea Cadets tonight. So I'm I'm very proud. And that that's an organization that's really helped um, him with his confidence and um so I'm, I'm maybe one day I'll get back into politics, but uh, for now, uh, it's really great to, you know, spend some time and watch my kids kind of come into their own right now. And they're, 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 they have some, they put some of this behind them as well, and they're doing okay. So thank you very much, Ashley. And one other um, anonymous attendee said, Carrie, thank you for being real. It's important to hear these things. So in closing, I want to thank all of you for attending. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you uh, to the keynote speaker. Thank you to Barb. Uh, thank you to all of the attendees who stuck around uh, a little bit over time. Uh, but I think the information that we were hearing was really important, uh, really heartfelt. And I appreciate all of you really sharing and taking this time out of your busy schedules to talk with us. Um, this will be available for other people to listen to as well in a little while once we get it edited and we'll put it up on the region's website as well. Uh, we will, there will be a short evaluation available once we close the Zoom link. Um, apparently will come up in the window. I haven't done this this way before, so we shall see if it works. Um, so just has a couple of questions of feedback about this session. So we would love that to hear your thoughts on this and also how we can improve this. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this session again in the future um, and prepare more women and underrepresented uh, people to run in the next election and also participate in other ways. It's not just uh, councillors and mayors that are ways that you can participate there. Um, should be coming out uh, from the region in the near future, the committee applications uh, for people to get involved in that way. And uh, we will love to have more diverse people get involved in that. So we hope you all gain some practical knowledge and skills on how to champion women leaders, particularly those serving in municipal government. This brings us to the end of our session at the Niagara Region Seat at the Table Project. Thank you to all of our partners and all who joined us tonight. We hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye.